So on the third day of class, I've got another handout for us to look at, another conceptual document, and then we will get hands-on, where last time we set up the analytics tools, right, the webmaster tools, Google Analytics, Google Search Console, Bing Webmaster, we set that up last time, we're going to look at the results of that now, hopefully we've had a week uh, of data um, to look at, but if not, I'll still talk about it conceptually. Before we get to that, I have a handout to give you. So your computer should be on, and you want to open on the top left corner. You want to open the computer window, double-click that. And then we'll go over to the network location. Under the network location here, classroom data drive Z, as in Zebra, double-click that one. Classroom data. And then you'll want to scroll down alphabetically to find Campos SEO. Open the Campos SEO folder. And this is everything I've given so far on the previous days, plus a new item, client marketing strategy. So what you want to do is drag that client marketing strategy to your desktop or flash drive, if you've got a flash drive. Syllabus is right there. So if you're new, you want to see the syllabus. That's where my email is at. And everything else I've given on previous days is right there. So copy that client marketing strategy. Again, the printer is off at the moment. You can print this if you'd like later. But again, like last week, this is a document you don't really need to print. We'll talk about it right now. Did everyone get a chance to find that client marketing strategy? You got a copy of it? Okay, so let's take a look at the client marketing strategy. Did everyone get a chance to sign the pink sheet? Where did the pink sheet end up? Oh, yes, uh, so the, the pink sheet, yes. Uh, Snake, could you, the, the, the pink sheet there, please? Uh, so let's uh, look at the client marketing strategy document. This is another document related to the concepts of SEM, search engine marketing, because it's not just enough what we need to do on your website, what else do you need to do outside of it? And to simply develop a, a strategy of keywords and such is not adequate enough. We need to put more effort into it. It's all a, a larger growing ball of yarn that we have to work with in modern SEO. So this document is the marketing strategy. Uh, we've touched upon it. Bef we've touched upon it before. We'll talk about it more. That uh, social media and such is very important for SEO. It's not just what you're doing on your website, but are you also active on social media, which is Twitter and or Facebook and or Instagram and or YouTube, etc. All of these dozens of social networks, and there are dozens of them. Obviously, Facebook is the big famous one, but there's many social networks out there. Um, before we get into social media, we should have some sort of plan, some sort of strategy. And that's what this document is. This is a version of what my company would be doing if we were hired by another company to do their social media, to do their marketing, to do their SEO. So I give this to you uh, for free as part of this lecture. So let's talk about this. These are various questions to think about and to answer. And again, you don't have to fill this in. You don't have to print it out and turn it in. I'm not going to give any grade. I can look at it and give my opinions about it. But this is more for yourself. The first big question here is, what do you want to accomplish? You have a presence online for a reason. Are you trying to sell something? Are you trying to build awareness? Are you artistic and want people to appreciate your work? Do you have a group you belong to that needs more members? Take a moment to write about what you want to accomplish with your online presence. And I'm using that term very generically, online presence, because it's not just about your website, right? It's about your social media and blogging and all of that. So I use the term online presence. That encompasses everything you're trying to do online. Why are you putting your business online? It's not just because you think that's what you need to do. It's not just because that's what your competitors are doing. What are you doing 
What are you trying to do online? What's the purpose of you being online, your business? So I have the example, Vic.co wishes to create a powerful social media presence because we want to interact with existing customers and through word of mouth reach new customers. We want to connect with people on Instagram in a very visual way. So here we're saying uh, we want to uh, reach new customers, work with existing customers, we want word of mouth, we want to get more fame so that we can get more clients, so that we can make more sales, etc. And we've heard about this Instagram thing and think it might work really well for our business, so we want to get on Instagram. Uh, the how and such, of course, uh, comes forth with more lectures and specifically the, uh, the, the social media class. I've been mentioning it that on Fridays I'm also doing a class on social media, 9.30 a.m., uh, 9.15 a.m. actually, 9.15 a.m., and we just did the lecture on Instagram last week. Uh, so this week we're going to talk about YouTube. So if you're interested, this Friday, 9.15, room 209, we're talking about YouTube. Will you be teaching that again through the summer? Yeah. And every, uh, every few months, these classes cycle in and out, different days and times. So here, the short answer would be, what are you trying to accomplish online? Sell products. But to think about it in deeper terms helps you to accomplish those goals. Well, I want to sell products, but I want to reach new customers in these age groups, or I want to use YouTube to market my uh, content to get more sales. So the more, um, the more accurate or detailed you can be with any of these answers, the better. We've got then the question of who is your target audience. It's important to focus on a target audience. It's nice to say that everyone would be interested in your product or your cause or your group, but it just isn't true in the real world. Who are the people that would like to know about your product? What are their age ranges, gender, economic group? musical style, etc. In short, who would care about your product? In essence, we are creating a persona of a potential client. So this happens all the time. We have a meeting, my company might have a meeting with a potential client, and we start to ask them all these questions, and we ask them, who's your target audience? And say, well, everyone, everyone's going to want our product. Wrong answer, because no, not everyone's going to want your product. Um, one that comes to mind is this gentleman who had a a, a very interesting product and of course he said everyone will want my product but his product was a baby stroller so literally no not everyone wants that product he has in mind an audience parents but through more talking we figured out okay he's gonna target uh, first time uh, so young first time parents young first time Latino parents that was more of his target audience. Obviously, his baby stroller works great for anyone that's got kids that need a baby stroller. But he figured out, I want to go with this target audience. And the more you can define that, the better. People who want to hire Vic.co are people that are trendy but know what they want. There are people that are in their 30s who are successful, own their own business, own their own company, need a website, and know the value of web design. So think about it, many of these things, in terms of the big companies. You don't think Coca-Cola has figured this out. You don't think Nike has figured this out. You don't think these big companies haven't uh, created these personas that they're reaching for. And this term persona is one that you see in the world of marketing. You know, marketing obviously is a, you know, a, a bachelor's degree amount of knowledge. We don't have time that far to talk about that much of marketing, but personas. Uh, this is literally creating, inventing a person, the person that we're trying to sell to. And I've got some questions to start to think about that. Age range, gender, economic group, etc. These are people that I'm thinking exist, and they do exist. I'm trying to reach this particular audience that has this amount of, you know, uh, monetary, uh, this income, Therefore, my product, I can market to them. And that's what I'm saying about, for example, Coca-Cola. Uh, they have the classic, you know, 100-year-old sugar water that everyone knows. 
but they've got also the organic tea, they've got the sports drink, they've got the pure mountain spring water. Coca-Cola has all of these uh, branches in their tree. It's not just classic Coke. Samson. Huh? Ever, ever looked at Samson, a product they give away for free to yeah. help sustain it? Yeah, every single company is what I'm getting at, that every company has some sort of target audience that is uh, being marketed to, and each one is different. The, pe the people that are buying, buying Powerade are not going to buy Coke. They need, I need this drink that has electrolytes and blah, 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 which if you look at the ingredients are almost the same as Coke and Powerade. I hate to break it to you. Uh, but the marketing is what really sells it. Um, so I want that pure mountain spring water. So I'm going to go buy Dasani, which I believe is owned by Coke, which, yeah, it comes from pure mountain spring water, tap water in New Jersey, filtered. So um, the thing is that who's this audience that you're trying to reach? And when you know who you're trying to reach, you can better market to them. In this example, I've mentioned here, trend even know what they want. So they're, they need a website that is modern, that is following the current trends, uh, if you pay attention to web design, you've seen the shift in style to what is known as flat design, which is websites don't have as much as before, uh, like gradients and drop shadows and highlights and like glass effects and all of that. People, uh, websites don't have that sort of effect anymore. They're flatter. They're simpler. Maybe maybe a very simple one pixel drop shadow pastel colors, uh, none of these gradients and drop shadow that make it look like, wow, that's a real thing on my, on my website. So the shift in web design is, is happening. You might have noticed it subconsciously. So we're targeting people that know that's what's new nowadays in web design, not about a cool, you know, glass effect and all of that stuff that was popular a few years ago. We're looking for people uh, to work for that are in their 30s and successful. That's not to say we can't make a website that someone for someone that's in their 40s or 50s or 90s, but we're targeting people in that age range because we feel we can create a product for them and we can possibly relate to them. They are successful, they own their own company. We want to work with entrepreneurs, you know, self-starters that have some kind of business at this age and that also know the value of web design, uh, figuratively and literally. Figuratively in that they know that a good website is going to attract traffic, and traffic could lead to sales, could lead to clients. And then um, figuratively, I mean uh, literally, because a good website costs money. You're not going to get a good website for $250, no matter how much that commercial sells you on it. You're going to get a better website at $2,000, at $5,000, at $10,000. I've worked on websites on that huge range there, you know, a $200 website up to a $10,000 website. And really, those that want, that think they can get away with a $500 website, a $1,000 website, we don't really want to work with them. We're seeing that they're penny pinchers. We're seeing that if they're going to fight, about getting a good website. They're going to fight about social media. Why, are you, why am I spending so much on tweets? Why am I spending so much on you on these Google ad word things? Why am I spending so much on this? I need sales. I don't want to spend. I need sales. Well, you need to make money to make money. So we're saying here, this fictional company, we can make a website for anyone in the world, any age range, and any business, but we want to focus on these demographics, on these characteristics, and maybe someone comes along that fulfills four out of five. We have to decide, okay, we'll forego the fifth one because they, they check box one, two, three, and four. They're not in their 30s, but everything else lines up here, good. We have to decide if we want to work with them or not. And it would be nice to be in a position to be able to turn down work. I know some of us aren't, uh, myself as well. But your target audience is very important. That's how these big companies are so big and profitable and famous and powerful because they know who to market to for good and for bad. Look at all these movies that come out. You say, I'm never going to watch that movie. 
because it doesn't appeal to you. I don't want to see yet another horror movie with teens getting killed. It's not my demographic, but I will watch this, you know, esoteric French movie that speaks to me. So whatever you're, uh, whoever you're targeting, uh, if you have it defined, you can strive for it. So that's the persona. You can create multiple ones, of course. I'm going to tweet to this fictional person because that person does exist. That person does exist that has this age range, this economic background, these hopes and dreams, whatever. And I'm going to tweet a different way to, these, to this other persona, and I'm going to reach that audience. The next one, the next question, do you have an aspirational competition? It's good to have role models both in life and in business. Is there a business you see that makes you think, I want to be like that? Or a business that makes you think, I want to do that, but better? List the company, person, brand, etc. that you feel is in competition with you, that you would like to emulate. Why do you want to emulate them? Vic.co Fields at XY Designs is our aspirational competition because they are well known in the field of web design and their style is unique and modern. So we're going to have competition. There's going to be yet another web designer, yet another realtor, yet another bakery, yet another fence company. There's always going to be competition, even if you think you're very, very unique. There's always going to be someone close enough to your competition. Okay, yes, I'm a bakery, but I'm San Diego's only, you know, uh, vegan-friendly, gluten-free, fair trade bakery. Nope, two miles down, there's another one. Or online, there's another one. So there's always competition. But what I'm getting at is take advantage of that. Who else is in competition with you? Who do you aspire to be? And the point of that was related to day one where we did that competitor analysis, where we looked at, here's the, uh, these other bakeries locally that are in competition, but what are they doing? I like what they're doing. I didn't think about doing that. I'll do a variation of that. I'll do something like that, but better or I'm seeing the trends of what the competition is doing that I'm falling behind on. So competition that I aspire to be, to be better than. Real world example for one of our clients, uh, this is a Mexican food restaurant. Uh, he, when we, when we worked with that client on this part, we asked the owner, we, we asked him what Who's your aspirational competition? Who, who do you think, you know, who do you want to be like or surpass? Uh, and he said, well, I want to be like Phil's Barbecue. Does everyone know who Phil's Barbecue is? Mm -hmm. If you don't, it's one of the big names in San Diego Barbecue. Classic American, you know, barbecue. This is a Mexican food restaurant, and it's traditional Mexican lamb barbecue, which is barbacoa de borrego. Classic Mexico City style slow cooked uh, lamb barbecue. Clearly, on the surface, very different from Phil's barbecue, which is, you know, beef with, you know, classic sauce and all of that. And so then you would say, well, how does that even relate? How is that competition? You have to think in terms, again, about direct competition and uh, side competition. Uh, the owner of this Mexican restaurant uh, wants to be like Phil's Barbecue because Phil's Barbecue is synonymous with barbecue in San Diego. When you talk about barbecue, it's Phil's Barbecue, which may or may not be the best. Everyone's got an opinion. Maybe I'm going to say Croom's is better. Maybe Phil's. I don't know. Everyone's got an opinion. But in San Diego, you talk about barbecue, it's often Phil's Barbecue. On, at Phil's Barbecue uh, restaurants, you, you get uh, in line, and then you're going to see a little sign that says, 40-minute wait at this point, just like Disneyland. So you're going to have a lot of time to wait just before even getting in. So the owner of this restaurant, this client, wants that. He wants to be known for good Mexican food in San Diego, the best. He wants to be known uh, as a place with a lot of, you know, uh, people wanting to get in. He does have a lot of traffic on the weekends. On the weekends, usually there's a list to get in. Throughout the week, it's, it's less. But Phil's Barbecue... You know, throughout the whole week, basically, there's always a wait. So this client wants to be like that for those various reasons, to be synonymous with that food, to have the clientele, uh, to have the 
the reviews. Phil's Barbecue's probably got like, I haven't checked recently, but like, probably at least a thousand Yelp reviews. Um, this client has about 200 or something. So the more reviews show more accurately. You know, five Yelp reviews and the and that company has got five stars, I wouldn't trust that. But if they've got 25 reviews, 55 reviews, 200 reviews, I'm going to believe those more. Because people always ask, well, aren't Yelp reviews fake? Some of them might be, some of them might be paid, some of them might be spam. But when you've got 200 reviews, 100 reviews, 900 reviews, many more of those are real. So, you don't have to have exactly direct competition that you're going to um, analyze. That was a restaurant, different styles of barbecue, but conceptually it's a competitor for those various reasons. So you have to think about competition. And if you don't know competition, you say, no, no, one, no one's my competition. There is going to be competition. That's why we spent day one doing that research, competitor analysis. Vision statement. A mission statement from last week tells the world where you stand. A vision statement tells the world where you're going. Write a statement that makes predictions about what you want to accomplish as a company or brand. You may set a time horizon, like five years. And the example is Vic.co will be known for providing eye-catching web design for San Diego's most elegant restaurants. So the mission statement from last week, we talked about what are we doing right now? What is our goal for our company right now? To make websites. The vision is, well, what are we going to be known for? What's our goal? Why are we in this? What's our time period that we want to accomplish that goal? That vision statement. Uh, Vic.co will be known for providing eye-catching web design for San Diego's most elegant restaurants. Okay, web design company that can make a website for any, any client. But we're focusing on, as we said previously over here about the persona, we're focusing on restaurants, San Diego restaurants. We're going to be known as the go-to company to make websites for San Diego restaurants. Now, I put in also there elegant, because obviously we can make a website for any taco shop. Uh, but oftentimes the smaller businesses have to spend, have very thin margins, meaning they've got to spend a lot to keep afloat. They have to spend on the food itself and the employees and the minimal amount of advertising. And then the website and such is like the last thing to worry about because sometimes they don't realize how valuable that online presence is. So we're focusing on this target audience. Our vision is that will be the go-to web design company for that demographic. I didn't put a time horizon example here, but I could have put, you know, within five years, within 12 months. That might be useful for, then, for, then, for you to then have an attainable goal. I've got this timeline on my head of 18 months uh, to, to reach this goal. Now, the problem about putting a timeline, of course, is people get discouraged when they don't reach their goal in the timeline. There's nothing wrong about pushing the timeline out further, uh, but I, I, I don't want you to think that if you didn't reach that goal within that time period that you failed, because people succeed and fail over and over, and a lot of times failures can lead to successes. You might just not see it at the moment. And then we've got the USP, the Unique Selling Proposition. What do you provide your customers that no one else can? What makes you stand out from the rest? How do you uniquely solve their problems? Answer the question of why. That is, why would a client hire you? Vic.co is based in San Diego, and many from our team graduated from Southwestern College, San Diego State University, and UCSD. We therefore know the local culture. We can create compelling websites that cater to San Diego companies. What makes you unique from every other web design company? We're saying that we're local here. 
we're saying that we're in San Diego, we're in the same time zone as you. We're not in another time zone where it's hard to get a hold of us. We know the local culture, we know San Diego, we know Southern California. We know, you know, we know what it means about uh, June Gloom and all of that. We know local, so this is trying to show what's unique about us because that restaurant could hire someone from LA or Portland or Austin or Madison or New York or wherever. They can all probably do a really good job, but someone in Madison who hasn't experienced our terrible 70 degree um, winters um, wouldn't know uh, some of the local culture and such if it's valuable for the, for the client. And so what's unique about us? This, this gets us into a larger discussion of why. So what I'm going to do is draw something here. This is a concept that comes from Simon Sinek. You may or may not have heard of him, but he is a speaker that has these concepts of leadership and entrepreneurship. And he's got various books and lectures, some of them for free online. You should look him up. But I'm going to draw this um, one of his big concepts, the golden circles, which are literally some circles. These are concentric circles. These are circles inside of circles. And in each of these circles, they're defined Um, can you read that okay? That says what? The outer circle is what? The inner circle is how? And the innermost circle is why? Each one of these, in theory, applies to businesses. Um, the outer circle, let's say my fictional web design company. What? What does my company do? We make websites. That's the what. Great, I make websites and so does a thousand other web design studios in San Diego. So everyone can easily answer the what. We do websites, we do social media, so does everyone else. I'm involved in a bunch of classes where I teach this stuff. So every semester I'm, I'm rolling out, you know, 15 to 30 new web designers every semester. So the what right there is very universal, hard to stand out from. How? Okay, how do I do web design? Well, I use uh, WordPress and I use Business Catalyst for shopping carts and Shopify and all of that. Okay, you've whittled down the field a little bit. Not everyone, perhaps, uses WordPress. Not everyone uses Shopify. Not everyone uses that tool to answer the how do you do web design. Some are using Dreamweaver. Some are using front page. Some are using HTML. Some are using Bootstrap, etc. So the how helps to differentiate me a little bit more. It's still a big amount of people. For example, WordPress, that's like 25% global market share. 25% of the world's websites are WordPress and rising. So I'm not as unique as I used to be five years ago when WordPress was the new kid on the block. So that one differenti differentiates me a little more. But the one that would differentiate me the most from the competition is the why. Why are you a web designer? And that's the hardest one to answer, honestly. You can obviously say, and it's legitimate to say, I'm in it for the money. I want to make money off of web design. Everyone needs a website. That's why I'm in it. Good answer. Fine. It might not differentiate you enough, but I could be saying what I said previously in the example of why. Well, I like, uh, you know, beautiful looking things. I want to make great looking websites, modern websites, artistic websites. I want to um, help small businesses. I'm a small business owner. Uh, I believe in small businesses. I want to help them succeed. I'm going to make them a great website. 
I am local to San Diego, so I'm going to target local San Diego companies. Um, and again, I like this. I, I'm in a job that I like, I, not just because I wanted to get this education, because I thought it would be lucrative, not because my parents said, you should be a doctor. Everyone loves doctors. Well, I want to do something of the why. I want to answer the why to do something that I want to do. So the better that can be answered, and obviously that answer can be very objective and subjective, uh, very artistic answer, and that's fine, or a pragmatic answer, that's fine, but that's the one that's often hard to answer. Why are you that, you know, fencing company? Well, to make money off of fencing, everyone needs fencing around their construction projects, but then the why of it, we have this unparalleled customer service. Uh, we have this, you know, made in America fencing materials. Um, you know, every company, we can break down this. We can apply this to every company if you think enough. The what, the how, and the why. But the, the why is often the hardest one. And that goes back to the USP, the unique selling proposition. What's unique about you? And often you can reach that by figuring out your why. And not just, to, not just to think about it and fill it out in this document and forget about it, but to help uh, guide you in everything you do online, not just for the SEO and the SEM, but even for the health of your business and the prosperity of your business. Um, you know, love them or hate them, but all of these big companies, they all started off with these ideas about, you know, why are we in business? Why, I don't know the full story, just some hearsay here, but why did Coca-Cola start off? This... Uh, pharmacist had this great invention of a cure-all tonic. He wanted to help everyone. And now Coca-Cola has become this multinational huge conglomerate, one of the most profitable companies in the world and with a lot of good and bad about it. But there was a why there in the beginning too. And as the decades go on and the changes for Coca-Cola, their why changes also. We can go look it up on their website. All these big companies are going to explain it in some way, maybe not literally say why, but a company history and an about us and all of that. Look at all of that stuff from these companies. Go look at the about page of all of these companies that you that, that you know or, or like or are competitors to. Look at their about page. Some of the bigger companies perhaps have that under the investor relations because there's a marketing arm to that as well. So this big concept here, you can go, you can further look into it more. If you do a quick search You can just go online and search Simon Sinek. Look all about him, his website and such, but then you'll see various free videos such as a 17 minute long video, a 39 minute long video on that concept of why. It's obviously more to more tangential than we really need to get into, but that's this document is a variation of what we do for clients. We get hired to do, you know, they, they hear, you guys, you guys do SEO? Can we hire you? We say, yes, of course. Let's have our, our meeting, our talk, our, our pre-meeting to talk about what you need and all of that and what we would recommend. And then if everything goes well, and then they don't scoff at, oh, I just thought we were going to do keywords on my website. If they then understand why it's a multi-pronged approach and they sign the contract, then we have a lot to do for us to understand their company, do the best job about writing those keywords, about doing that social media, about revamping their website and their logo. Um, I believe I mentioned it last week, maybe, or all my classes run together nowadays, unfortunately. I might have mentioned it here or not, but one of the clients, this client that I mentioned of the Mexican food, it's lamb barbecue, and uh, the, the logo that they had before they hired us was a little lamb, uh, and we were seeing that all of the competition in Mexican food often had a little animal in the logo. That seafood place had a shrimp. That chicken place had a chicken. That other lamb place, you know, that other beef place had a steer. So all of the other competition had some animal in their logo. How are you going to stand out from the rest if you're another animal? Well, our analysis showed 
what the competition doesn't have you know, is a non-animal logo usually. So we designed a brand new logo that focuses on one of the ingredients of the, of the food. This traditional style of lamb barbecue is flavored with maguey plants, maguey leaves, which are related to agave plants, so they're like these long, triangular, kind of spiky leaves, and the lamb is slow roasted with that, so the logo incorporates that, that leaf, that plant, whereas the competition are still doing animals, they're still doing the chickens, they're still doing the fish and all of that, and this one stands out at the very least there because it's different from the competition. One of the many unique things for that client. So all of this conceptual stuff, again, this is not any sort of homework. You don't need to fill this in and turn it out. You can print it out if you'd like, but I give you this Word document for you to actually write stuff here. And obviously this is a big endeavor to think about writing. You don't have to do it now or anything like that, but if you'd like to do it and I can take a look at it and give you an opinion, that would be fine. But any, uh, any general questions at, at this point about this document, this concept? Yes? Is this true and based on your company? Yes. Yes. yes, this is something, this is a variation of what we do for, for my real company, yes. Mm -hmm. I always try to provide in these classes real world things because I, I work for a company that we do this for a living and I want to teach the latest things. And is WordPress that same website? Nowadays that's the main kind of website we work with. Uh, when we started off, we were using Dreamweaver, and Dreamweaver is great. It's still around, and people still use it, but the limitation of it is that we would always get clients that's, that would say, okay, great website, we love it, can we make a few changes? We say, yes, give us your changes, we'll make the changes. We made the changes. They say, well, can we make the changes when we want to? And we say, yes, no problem, here's your login information, just use Dreamweaver to make changes to your site. They say, what's Dreamweaver? So people didn't know how to use that tool to make changes to their own site. WordPress eventually came along and it has made it much more user-friendly for novices to make a nice-looking website and professionals to make a great-looking website. And maybe that business owner never wants to touch their site or build their own site, but once in a while they want to change the prices on the menu and such. We can give them access to their site, no problem, and they can log in and not break the whole site. Because in traditional web design, if you change one code, it could break the whole site. And now in in tools like WordPress or Weebly or Squarespace or Wix, all of these modern ones, it, it protects you more and you can create a good product. That's mostly what we use nowadays, but we can do different types of, types of sites. Any other questions on this document or other concepts? Yes? Um, I, unfortunately, no. I wouldn't quite. Uh, the question is about you know. I'm going to say it the mean way, uh, begging for reviews. I wouldn't. I wouldn't do that. Or the meaner way, bribing for reviews. I wouldn't do that. Uh, I would possibly gently suggest, hey, if you liked our services, don't forget to review us on Yelp. But yeah, a lot of people don't use Yelp to write reviews, and even those reviews are not going to be that valuable for you because Yelp filters out people that have created an account just to give a review, positive or negative. So, you know, someone is so mad at a business, they're going to go create a Yelp account and give them one star. That one's probably going to be filtered out, so I'm not worried. The opposite is also true. Someone really loved my business, and, you know, I, I even walk them step by step to create an account and they give me a great five-star review, Yelp is probably going to remove that one too because they just created the account to give a good review. Yelp wants people that have used Yelp for a while and have made friends and have written several reviews and a variety of topics, and those are the reviews that stay and stick and matter. So to ask people about, can you give me a review if I give you this, this coupon and such, I don't recommend that because it could come back and bite you and it could be a waste of time and money. You spent that $10 and it got removed because Yelp says, oh, this is kind of like a shady review. Yes? However, it's not unusual for websites to say how to, uh, if you want to write an article for us, here's our email address. An article or review? Review or blog post or... 
That's true. Blog. Uh, uh, that's that's very useful. External content from blog reviews is very useful, but just on the topic of Yelp, that that is a much finer tightrope to walk. Um, so. For your <laughs> um, so that's just a fine fine rope we have to walk about asking for reviews, how positive, how negative. I've dealt with clients that. That they're like, you know, I, I want to get more Yelp reviews. What do, I, what do I need to do? And I say, well, one possibility is, so this is an example of, of a client. He owns a comic shop. And I say, every time you give, you know, the bag of comics to the person, you have some sort of little paper there, not something that says, you know, 10% off with a Yelp review, but some paper that says, don't forget to review us on Yelp. Or, you know, we're glad you're, you visited us. Don't forget to review us on Yelp. Or just the Yelp logo or something. Or the Angie's List logo or the TripAdvisor logo. Something that reminds them to give that review. And the, the, the conversion rate of that is still going to be very low. You know, I'm going to sell 100 bags of comics and maybe three of them are going to review me. And I spent the money to print out those 100 little printouts. But still, three reviews are great because those are building upon itself. Positivity breeds positivity, good reviews breed good reviews, and people are looking at Yelp and all those review sites more and more. So there's a whole concept and an art and a science to talk about getting reviews and such, but um, we'll probably touch on it in deeper detail as time goes on. Um, any, any other questions on these concepts? Actually, I have a question about yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so are you saying that like if I don't know if someone is just really impressed with somebody and so they decide to log in to because they like that one like I got the shoe that looks like they like mm -hmm. and chances are it won't stay because it, it, it's the only one that's ever written. Chances are yes. Uh, Yelp uh, does that for the negative and the positive reviews because then they're saying that's gaming the system. You asked your friends or your family or your siblings to log in and create an account just to give you five stars, even if it's four stars. They just went in to skew the system, to game it, to, to skew you toward positive reviews. Yelp is going to give more precedence to those people that have all those little badges that say Top Yelper 2014. That's someone that spent a lot of time writing 10 reviews every month, meaningful reviews on a variety of topics. People spend a lot of time on that, and they build this clout, and Yelp cares about that to some degree a little bit more than the regular old person that just creates an account to trash you or to give you good reviews. Um, I will mention a few more things about Yelp because I, I always forget, so... Let me make some notes here about Yelp. I'm going to call this generically review site tips. Because Yelp is not the only one. We have a bunch of other review sites. Google, you can do reviews on Google, you can do reviews on Yelp, Kudzu, Angie's List, Glassdoor, etc., etc., etc. Review site tips. I'm going to make these notes and add them to the network folder by the end of the day, I'm going to say don't bribe for reviews. So that is don't give incentives. That's a nicer way to say it. Don't give incentives for these reviews. Um, you know, 10% off your next meal if you review us. Um, even worse, you know, a free meal next time if you give us, if you give us a five-star review. That's even worse. Uh, but don't give anything to get those reviews. Do encourage reviews. What's the difference there? That you're not giving, you know, quid pro quo, that you're not giving something for something. The best time to encourage is after a happy client. After you've done some sort of job, sold them something, they're happy with your services, in some way encourage them. You know, send an email, tell them in person, somehow, some way encourage them, remind them, you're, you've, you had a good experience in our company, share that with everyone on Yelp. And if they say, oh, I've never used Yelp, then drop it. Don't try to say, okay, I'll help you set it up, and all of that, because then you're just creating that account 
that Yelp is going to remove anyway. So that positive review is just going to be removed anyway. Um, good reviews are good. Guess what? Bad reviews are good. Well, why? Bad reviews could be turned into good reviews. It's not just that someone goes online and trashes you. They had probably a legitimate gripe that you could possibly fix, which would then turn that... Because people can rewrite their reviews. They're not set in stone. Once someone gives you one star, it's not going to be one star forever. They could increase that. Three stars, five stars, two stars. They could increase it if you deal with it the right way. That's actually like the I look at. Uh -huh. is, the, is this responsiveness? Yes. They're really responsive right away after a bad review. Mm -hmm. And they have something to fix it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's all about that. You So so there's this example here. That you look at the company's trying to make good, which could then give me more um, peace of mind to actually give them my business. So good reviews are good, obviously, because uh, positivity, because pos positivity breeds, breeds, breeds positivity. You have all of these great Yelp reviews. That's going to skew people to also give good Yelp reviews, consciously or subconsciously. We are a very peer pressurized species. Uh, we see what the rest of us are doing. Everyone's doing something a certain way. We're going to do it. Yes, we're going to jump off that cliff. Yes, we're going to vote for that person. Yes, we're going to give these uh, ratings for good and for bad. So as you build good reviews, that will help also get you more good reviews. Not always, of course, because there's going to be bad reviews. And the reason for the bad reviews that they're being good is because they can be, or they could be, um, converted to good reviews. How? Again, you're not going to bribe. No bribes. You're not gonna. You're not gonna read that review. Okay, they said I had a terrible time at that restaurant. There was a tooth in my uh, pastrami sandwich, um, and it was a and there was a crown in there too. So. Uh, you're not going to bribe by saying, we're so sorry for that, uh, that your next meal is on the house. That's going to be your first instinct, perhaps. Don't do that. That's, that's that bribe. Because there is, unfortunately, a group of people that make a living off of giving bad Yelp reviews to get free stuff. Yep. They go off and they go, even if they didn't even walk in the door, they're going to write a bad Yelp review. This bakery was terrible, blah, 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 blah. And then the bakery is naive and they say, we're so sorry, come back, tell the manager you get a free 10% off. And they didn't even step in the, in the door. So don't give bribes. Don't give away free this, free that, 10% off this and that. Don't give away free things. What you instead want to do is do acknowledge the problem Do um, realistically vow to fix the problem. To invite them to, you know, try again, but not by saying come back for a free meal next time, Do free not dessert. Attack. Do not attack them. Yeah, that one goes be, be, be before. Without saying, but we, we do need to say it. Don't attack. Don't get mad and, and say, you know, this is so wrong. Uh, you're so wrong and you don't know what you're talking about. And we've had these other great customers and you're just an outlier. Again, oh, this also goes here. Do respond publicly. You can respond to people privately uh, or publicly. You might say, okay, I don't want people to 
to see this. This person said they found a tooth in the pastrami. I'm, I need to do damage control here. I'm going to reply to them privately. No, you want to do it publicly. You want to see, that you're, you want to show people that you're trying to fix this. You want people to see that you're trying to fix this publicly. And that is also valuable. That's also valuable to Yelp. I'm sure somewhere hidden in their algorithm, they take that into account. How many public replies as opposed to public, how many private replies as opposed to public replies, I'm sure Yelp takes that into account. I don't know what percent, that's trade secrets, but I'm sure they take that into account. This company is trying to make things right publicly instead of doing it privately. Let's further help them on Yelp. Who knows? And so you don't want to attack them in private or public it's not going to stay private if it's private. They're going to screenshot that and share it all over Facebook. Say, look at how this, look at how this mean old bakery is being mean to me. Don't shop there, friends. So don't attack, don't brag, do it publicly. These things here. Uh, there was an example uh, a few years ago, another client, this restaurant, uh, they, um, they, they got a bad Yelp review because someone had complained about the table next door, their kids had really noisy, squeaky shoes. <laughs> and the little kid was running around the restaurant. Now, obviously, that's a really hard thing to deal with because, okay, those parents are at a point where they don't care and they're letting their kids run around and they don't hear the squeaking anymore and everyone can parent the way they want, but then they are distracting the the rest of the patrons and this person was mad why didn't the owner come and tell them please keep it down you're ruining my anniversary dinner and all of that and then they went on Yelp to give a bad review so you might think that's a low blow sure but if that person is a semi at least a semi serious Yelp reviewer that has written 10 reviews in three years you know I don't know the algorithm but they've actually used Yelp effectively their review is not going to get taken down, and that two stars is still going to hurt you, even though some might say, that's a low blow. Why, why are you going to penalize the restaurant uh, for, the, for the problems of, of a family? So on something like that, you, you do have to think really hard how you're going to reply. I forgot how we replied on that one, how we told them to reply and such, but you know, it was again about, you know, we, we try to have the best environment, we're sorry that yours was ruined, uh, but... Uh, you know, we get a variety of people coming in and we try to make the best environment for everyone. Um, come back another time, you'll see that our cozy, uh, quaint restaurant will fulfill your needs. It's just that bit of bad luck on that day, but we'll keep in mind to keep the, you know, the comfort of all of our patrons in the forefront. You know, we're not going to say, we're sorry for that noisy kid, here's a free calamari next time. We're not going to do that. So some various uh, ideas to think about regarding reviews, and it's not just Yelp, it goes over to the other ones. So there's Yelp, there's Angie's List, there's Kudzu, Kudzu, there's Glassdoor, what else, um, TripAdvisor, not all of these, Google Local, Bing Local, not all of these. Um, not all of these apply to everyone, but you might be surprised. Why oh, didn't know people were reviewing me on Bing? And it's not good. Well, once you know that, you can deal with it. It could be different people on different platforms. You do want to deal with them all in the ways that I've mentioned here. Any questions on, on any of this? Okay. Let's um, let's take our first break, and uh, when we'll, what we'll do when we come back is I want to look at the um, the webmaster tools again. Those that we set up last week, hopefully we've got some data to show for it. If we don't, that's okay because I'll show you examples of real clients with real data. I'll tell you what the data means, how to use it effectively, and all of that, and then I'll have another handout for you. So it's 1.32, we'll take a break until 1.42, and then we'll be back.